background is as a trader. My co-founder, I met him at the skate park, which is a really interesting story. I had to build a company around the analytics of, of Darabit's options market. And so that's how Genesis Volatility was born. We raised two funding rounds and ended up selling to Amber Data in uh, October of 2022. There's a lot of like, and there's kind of FOMO dynamics where it's like people care about crypto and crypto's moving higher. And then people just don't care about it on the way down. From the outside, you look at all these other projects and you're thinking like, wow, like they, they seem to raise money like no problem. Like why is it so hard for us? My, conclu- my final conclusion is that when we actually closed this round and finally were able to close, it was that it probably from the outside to everyone else, it probably looks like we just raised a round like it was easy. You know, from the grass is greener, like the people who are in it is probably always a ground. I'm super excited to be joined today by Greg, uh, the founder of uh, Genesis Volatility. Uh, We have a mutual friend, and so uh, she spoke very highly of you and really looking forward to the podcast today. Thanks, Logan. Happy to be here. I always find um, everybody's kind of journey into crypto and how they fell down the crypto rabbit hole super unique. Uh, traders approach it from one aspect, uh, engineers re- approach it from another. So could you talk about a little bit about your own personal journey and ultimately what led you to get involved into crypto? Yeah, happy to. So basically my background is as a trader. Uh, I was a proprietary trader in Chicago uh, for many years. I started out in New York as an intern at SMB Capital, and then after graduating college, I was uh, trading treasuries at Chopper Trading in Chicago, and later joined DRW and traded there for a while as well. Uh, in late 2015, I actually quit trading at DRW to trade my own book in the crypto space. That's actually where I met my, or when I met my co-founder. I met him at the skate park, which is a really interesting story. He, he like completely shreds, and I was asking him if I could take a picture of his of his tricks and we started talking and and I introduced him to Ethereum. Um, So I first discovered crypto actually while I was still in college in 2012, me and Linda Shea, who actually runs a crypto hedge fund called Scale Capital now, we decided to do a research report on Bitcoin. We sort of downloaded a tour, went on a dark web, check out what, what was Bitcoin and where was it being used. And at the time I was, a little freaked out by it just because of the, the dark web and stuff like that. So I ended up not investing in it. This was $7 Bitcoin. And it wasn't until later in 2013, while I was trading treasuries, I was still following crypto sort of at a distance. And I saw Bitcoin break $200 uh, all time high for the first time. So you sort of buy that breakout. <laughs> it's kind of my thinking from a technical perspective. And that's when I first sort of actually invested in, in, in Bitcoin. Um, and so I was basically in the crypto space since 2013. When I met my co-founder in 2015, uh, I introduced him to Ethereum. He wanted to learn more. And so me and him basically started kind of doing research and, and investing together in the space, like researching ICOs and things like that and, and, and trying our hand at that. And later in 2019, we decided to launch crypto options analytics platform. I had just discovered Bitcoin when they listed Ethereum back in April 2019. And I was really excited by this market. Uh, I was trading options for a long time. My background was in, in, in options. And so to me, like crypto options were this new sort of innovative space where there's a lot of pricing inefficiencies, which there still are today. And so that was a really interesting portal into that market. And so me and Pat my co-founder decided to build a company around the analytics of, of Darabit's options market. And so that's how Genesis Volatility was born. We incorporated in, in January 2020. We raised two funding rounds and ended up selling to Amber Data in uh, October of 2022. And so that was a, a really exciting time. Amazing. I, uh, lots of to parse apart, but I think... Just given your time in the market and being involved in crypto since the very early days, kind of Ethereum, ICO, uh, even Bitcoin, uh, what have been some of your biggest learnings just from going through multiple cycles? Yeah, that, that's an interesting perspective. So, you know, the early ICO days, I I ended up not investing in the Ethereum ICO and did the Mastercoin ICO instead. So that was a disaster. 
uh, and a huge regret. But once the Ethereum started trading, I, I finally got in. So one of the things that really stuck stuck out to me, and I'm sort of an ETH maxi as opposed to a Bitcoin maxi, but to me, Bitcoin had paved the way for the viability of a digital asset. And then when I discovered Ethereum, uh, Ethereum already had a, a predecessor. So I already knew that like market caps could reach a certain level because of what Bitcoin had done. But then Ethereum was such a better mousetrap. So before the Ethereum ICO, people used to talk about colored coins, which are basically like smart contract coins, but essentially, long story short, uh, it's a lot of the capabilities that, that ETH provides. And so to me, that sort of base layer infrastructure play made a lot more sense. And I knew that the market caps could already go crazy. So that was an easier trade than just buying Bitcoin uh, as a as a, like a new asset class. So that was sort of one of the first things in, in early sort of asset cycles that seemed really interesting to me. And then in sort of price cycles, one of the things that we'll notice a lot is that when crypto is rallying, and this was true in 2013, like when we rallied up to $1,000 in November 2013 or whatever it was, um, we got like a Wired article about Bitcoin. There's a lot of excitement about Bitcoin. And then the next two years was this huge bear market where Bitcoin ended up bottoming them out at like $200 again. And it wasn't until sort of the 2017 bull market that prices really like had another major run up. And so there's a lot of like, and there's kind of FOMO dynamics where it's like people care about crypto and crypto is moving higher. And then people just don't care about it on the way down. In traditional assets, a lot of like the panic and the enthusiasm, but enthusiasm is not the right word. A lot of like the, I don't know, the, the talk around the markets are during crypto crash or during market crashes. 2008, like everyone was an economist and no one really cared about the markets in like 2010 and 2011 or whatever, 2012. And so there's a little bit of those dynamics that are flipped on its head. So those are some, thing, some things that are really interesting that actually translate really nicely into the vol markets. So the vol markets, to me, have a few different regimes. We actually just talked about this recently in a report. And what we're trying to quantify are sort of like these positive vol regimes where calls are more expensive than puts versus negative vol regimes where puts are more expensive than calls. And then the different sort of levels of implied volatility total in, in total. And so to me, this mirrors really nicely with sort of those cycles that you see in the spot market or the cash markets. Interesting. Interesting. I definitely want to come back to the volatility aspect as well. When, one thing that you said there earlier was kind of around like you, I mean, got into the space kind of when Bitcoin was the only kind of asset to really play in within crypto. Um, then definitely colored coins came along, uh, which was trying to expand on that. And then ultimately Ethereum. And now you're much more of an Ethereum fan. When you're looking at these different assets, how do you personally kind of approach them? Do you approach them from like a technical point, from a trading point? Um, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So back in the day, here's how I thought about it. The bond market is five times as big as the stock market. If I pick out one stock market out of the whole entire stock market, call it Apple, well, that market cap at the time was like a trillion dollars. And then the entire crypto market was a fraction of that. And so to me, it was like such an easy kind of valuation ladder to say, okay, there's so much room for growth here that when you're buying a total market cap of call it $100 billion at the time for crypto, if that even, it seemed like there's no ceiling to the asset. So that's kind of an initial back of the envelope sort of valuation metric that I was using a lot. And then from like a technical analysis perspective, you know, a lot of people hate technical analysis. Uh, technical analysis, the way that I define it, it's not really about uh, telling the future. It's more about finding like risk, risk points or inflection points for risk management. So for example, let's look at that $200 level again. Well, when you're making new all-time highs above $200, $200, that, that level is important. There's a lot of significance to it because it means that prices have garnered enough enter, interest and new entrance into the market that like the all-time high level uh, is a good inflection point for like, I want to get in here 
and this is a nice this is like a new paradigm a new environment of of, of price potential potential price appreciation you can also kind of do the same analysis on the flip side so like uh, when we had the bear market in 2015 and 2016 and uh the price low was 200 you can tell you, you can give yourself the 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 hard stop of 200 saying okay like this is the previous bear market low like assuming this asset has real uses and and people really do believe in it we shouldn't go back below those levels because that that's an old paradigm that those prices reflect an old paradigm and so that to me that's kind of like how i like to use technical analysis i like to use it as like levels or thresholds that shouldn't be uh you know violated so to speak so that's kind of how i use that aspect in the market and then lastly like from an options market and i'm sure we'll talk about this later but you can also look at sort of like the this, this statistical distributions of what the option prices are implying so like right now in 2023 call options are more expensive than put options even six months out that's sort of implying that the option market is expecting more upside surprises more than downside surprises for the next six months and so vol shocks will be on the positive spot side and so those types of assumptions whether you disagree with the options market and you think it's an opportunity or you agree with it and you want to get long spot because of it um, they all give us like really interesting insights they can sort of make your thesis around interesting very interesting i don't get the opportunity to talk to, with very many traders. So this will be a good conversation. Hopefully uh, excited to learn a lot on maybe before jumping into uh, ultimately how you started your company and even the volatility report that you guys put out today. I, I'm curious on like your point of view, I, because I know, I think wh which chain is Deribit running on uh, for the, their options market? So, so they're a CFI exchange, and they mostly trade uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. So you can you can send Ethereum directly to them. So they have like wallets on the Ethereum chain, and then they also have wallets on the Bitcoin chain. Okay, I, I know some um, products are ultimately trying to do this uh, kind of options market on chain. Um, what is your point of view to try to ultimately get some of these things that uh, have existed in like the web two world with options market and putting them on kind of more crypto native rails? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So anyone who follows me knows that my favorite option protocol is Lyra. And so the reason why I like that, I like Lyra a lot is because there's sort of two approaches to making options on chain. One of them is we take the Deribit model and we replicate it on chain. And like some protocols have done a really good job of that. Like Zeta protocol has done a really good job of that. And then there's sort of this other perspective, which is like, we don't want to make something that's exactly like Deribit because the way that people interact with on-chain protocols is different than how to interact with say Deribit. And so to me, that's the Lyra protocol. And so again, the predecessor sort of mindset, Uniswap is, you know, an on-chain DEX that works very differently than say, like, uh, what, what was the early one? Delta Exchange or something like that, which was sort of yeah. what a book limit style. Yeah. And so the way that people interact on-chain is just not the same. And like, there's a lot of demand for passive liquidity providing that is positive expectancy or ex positive, positive expected value. And so it's really hard to set up infrastructure to become a market maker on a good platform with low latency, such as Deribit, I mean, they're like the best, but like that alone is a lot of work. And then forget about doing that on chain where you have latency, throughput issues, all that stuff. And like transaction costs and, and things like that. So to me, like we just need to think about a different model. It's like, we don't need to just do the exact same thing in a new place. Like that's kind of boring. I want to do something different that provides a similar level of service in a different place. And that's really where sort of a smart AMM model like Lyra comes in really nicely. LPs can become passive market makers. The AMM has such smart logic that it, it delta hedges, it vega reprices, it has all these elements in it that make it so LPs don't essentially get screwed. 
And then from the taker perspective, you can both buy the open options or sell the open options, which is very much similar to a classic exchange experience. Uh, but now you're, you're trading against an AMM. And, and some of the things that AMMs provide that traditional market makers don't provide is that in fast markets, and we, we saw this with the FTX collapse, like the AMM was still standing there making markets. So to me, this is like new innovation to get a similar experience. And that's like, that's what really excites me. So to me, I think they're doing a good job. And are they deployed on Ethereum layer one or? So they're on Optimism and on Arbitrum. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Very and cool. Just uh, full disclosure, I, I own some of their tokens. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not uninvested in them. Interesting. Um, no. Do you, so are you, yeah, instead of maybe going more technical, let me kind of shift the conversation. I would love to learn, I mean, so you ultimately, uh, we're talking about Genesis and volatility and ultimately how you um, ended up creating this company uh, and really using Deribit as kind of uh, a source to pull data. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, that journey and ultimately um, what was kind of led up to that and maybe go a little bit deeper into um, just some of the offerings that the company had as well? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to chat about the founder's journey. So, I mean, for any any founders who probably are out there had a similar experience where, you know, when, when you're deciding to get started, it's a little bit scary. I think one of my most encouraging phone calls was with Luke over at Darebit. So we made us like a basic MVP and, or minimum minimal viable product or like just a kind of a beta product that we hosted locally on our computers. And we gave him a call and we said, hey, can we meet with you? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so he didn't know us at all. We're just some random people. And I said, look at all these charts we built using your data. We want to build a business around your data. Are we allowed to resell your data and build a business around it? And so he completely gave us his blessing. Uh, he allowed us to resell there, but allowed us to resell their data so we can actually have a viable product. Now, in my mind, this seemed like this is going to be easy. Like <laughs> thousands of people are going to sign up for this. And overnight, this is going to be a really good product. Um, it was actually a lot more of a grind than I thought from uh, like a customer perspective. So we decided to follow a lot of different strategies. I think we had a really good product and I had good experience in the markets already so I could talk about them. But the idea is like, how do we capture market share? And so we have a product in the market that has fancy charts and stuff like that. We built a Twitter. And so we decided to like basically talk about trading ideas or insights that, that I found in the market and put them on Twitter. We built a weekly newsletter uh, about four months in from incorporating. That gave us like a, a weekly recap of the volatility markets and or the crypto volatility markets. And then lastly, we started a YouTube channel to explain crypto options. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is that crypto options is pretty niche. Like crypto is niche, volatility is niche, and then crypto volatility is like the niche of the niche. And then go into DeFi crypto options, like that is the tip of the iceberg as far as nicheness goes. And so in a way that's really good because there's not a lot of people who can compete in that pool. But it's also a very small pool. So I truly believe that crypto options, both in the DeFi and CeFi space, are going to have a lot of growth in Airbnb here to stay for the long run. So getting a head start uh, is really good because you get to build networks, you get to talk to people, you get to get your name out there and things like that. So those are some things that really excited me. So this is about six months in. We have sort of all those elements in place. And then we decided to raise a funding round. So we raised a $3 million valuation funding round for our first round. And that was, <laughs> that was hard. It was a really, really hard round to close. Um, and it, it's so interesting because from the outside, you look at all these other projects and you're thinking like, wow, like they, they seem to raise money like no problem. Like, why is it so hard for us? We got a product in market. We actually have revenue. We have a reputation. Uh, we're cl really working closely with the exchanges. Um, and so it was a little bit perplexing. And it's actually one of those things my, my final conclusion is that probably when we actually closed this round, we finally were able to close it. And it was led by Nascent, which is a, a crypto VC in the space. And very thankful to them. Uh, when we finally closed it, we basically, my conclusion was that it probably 
from the outside to everyone else, it probably looks like we just raced around like it was easy. And so if you know, from the grass is greener, like the people who are in it is probably always a grind. It's kind of my final conclusion. Um, so that, that was kind of our first year. I was really happy about that. We were able to, we didn't pay ourselves anything, which is, you know, basically how it works. Uh, but yeah. after closing around, we were able, able to pay ourselves like 30 grand a year. So I was pretty happy with that 30 K and then hire, hire someone else, uh, to help out. So that was, that was really cool. And then we, so I'm happy to just, should I keep going on this or? No, keep cool? going. I, 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 okay, I mean, cool. I, I think like these, yeah, I, I would definitely echo your sentiments that like everybody views it from the outside and they're like, oh, yes, like they they raise that round, like how they look, how they do that so easily. And I, I think these stories are important for founders to hear because it's not always that case. Uh, it can, I would say those are the outliers, not the the normal. So please continue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. So then our second year was a lot um, a lot smoother because we were able to raise the second round with a lot more ease. But basically, after closing our first round, we continued to, to iterate out our product and get more of a foothold in the space. And then we onboarded some really kick-ass advisors uh, that I really like a lot. They're kind of OGs in the traditional space. Um, and that that sort of helped us close our second round. So again, we just continued to build our reputation. We launched our own podcast in crypto option space. And then uh, we went out to raise another round and, and the crypto market was pretty hot. This is 2021. Um, mm. Crypto, I mean, Bitcoin was like you know, past 50K, it had just touched 70K. Everyone's talking about 100, 100 grand Bitcoins, things like that. So it's a different environment. Um, and in this, t- in this time, instead of a total grind, we had an oversubscribed round. So this, at this point, we had built enough reputation and there's enough momentum behind us that uh, I think we're two and a half times oversubscribed and we really got to pick out our investors of choice. And so uh, Delphi Digital is our number one choice investor. Uh, uh, this guy, Avi over there, he's like definitely a, a really cool guy. And I was super happy to have him lead our round. So he did that. Uh, all our past investors tacked on and we got a couple more investors and we ended up raising a $3 million round. So the first round was 300000 The second round was $3 million. And so it was just interesting that um, one of the feedbacks we got is that if you raise too small of a round, like people don't even want to bother because it's not, it's not enough investment for them to justify their own time. So in a way, like raising a higher round uh, enables kind of bigger fish to play and, and they get more interested. So that was pretty interesting. And then the last sort of element was actually selling to Amber data. So, after raising our second round, we hired some more people. As a founder, I thought one of the hardest things was scaling a team. So we were actually able to hire a couple really good hires that I'm, I'm super happy. Like our team was really, I mean, they still are, they still work at Amber Data, but our team was really good. But it was hard to, to expand beyond that. It's really hard to find good talent. And once you find that talent, like, can they like get up to speed quick enough to do the things that you need them to do? And so we actually ended up pursuing the M and A path because we found that this would be the best way to scale. The thing about crypto is that things move so fast that if you're not moving forward, you're dying. And I felt like we had a really good head start and a good grip in the market. Um, and if I didn't sort of keep up, I I just I got just I could just feel it in my gut like we're going to lose everything because like others will be able to pass us and then we'll become irrelevant and then we won't matter. So we need to scale extremely fast. And that was sort of my biggest concern as a CEO. Like, how do I scale and, and make sure we keep our market share? I like, I want to grow our market share, but I'll, I definitely don't want to lose any market share. And so m and seemed like the cleanest way to do that. And so uh, we met the founders of Amber Data. There was a really good cultural fit there. And um, they're a bigger organization. And so they were able to help us scale our efforts. And now we're sort of, now I lead the uh, derivatives data aspect of Amber Data, which is a data conglomerate for crypto. So they do on-chain data, they do spot data, and now they do basically uh, derivatives data through us. And so that, that made the most sense. It was the best fit. Interesting. Fascinating story. I think, I mean, one thing that you mentioned there was kind of, I mean, 
almost kind of like pushing a boulder uphill uh, initially. And then once you get a certain amount of momentum, it kind of reverses course and things become much easier, especially when Bitcoin's mm -hmm. a, above 50K. But on the advisor side and like scaling talent, what were, I mean, obviously you were talking about like acquiring talent and that being rather difficult, but on the advisor side, was there any like particular, um, like words of wisdom that you have to founders or builders that are looking to either find help or advisors or like go and scale teams uh, to the level that they need to? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So for me, uh, sort of the two advisors, uh, Tony Stewart and Ewan Sinclair, who came on at sort of the, the tail end before our second round, um, these are people that I, I had like read, I had read a lot of you and Sinclair's books. We have another advisor, Mark Trapashin, who was with us since day one. So I want to acknowledge him too. He was really good. Um, but uh, Tony and you and we, we basically, uh, they came on later. And so I was already a big fan of you and I had read all his books. I knew all his works. I knew him very well. And so it was, that was just kind of a little bit of fate. We hired uh, Jalen who basically ran our operations at Gval and a lot of our marketing. And so he was, he would do a lot of outbound reaching out to people and saying, check out our platform. I see your own options. Like, what do you think about this? And so he actually reached out to you by coincidence and you was really receptive. He wanted to check out our platform. And then I talked to my co-founder I was like, we got to make this guy an advisor. And so my co-founder was cool with that. So I ended up jumping on the call with him and, and explaining to him what we're doing. And he said, really interested and excited. So that kind of just, maybe fell in my lap a little bit. And then with Tony Stewart, it was very similar as well. He, um, he actually had reached out to us um, to see kind of, it was kind of a long story, but there was a, there was a competitor that out there who also wanted Tony and, and Tony actually reached out to us and we were able to snag him. And so that was something I was, I was really cool. And I was really happy to have him on, on board. I think one of the things for advisors is that having an advisor that's very engaged uh, is super useful. You can get advisors that are kind of like on the cap table, but they don't really do anything. Then you have other advisors who you talk to every day. And so those, those two are guys I essentially talk to every day, super engaged to provide a lot of value. And so I would say, you know, that's something to keep in mind when you're looking for advisors, how engaged are they going to be? Cause at the end of the day, you're the one building the company. Definitely. And I always kind of echo that sentiment to founders that I talk to as well as making sure that, I mean, both of your incentives are aligned and that on like the advisory side that they're working for you. And like you said, just like not getting people at the end of the day on the cap table uh, just mm. for like kind of naming purposes. But no, it, it's amazing to hear your perspective and kind of how helpful that they were throughout the process. Um, it's fascinating on. So ultimately you got acquired, um, which is no small feat in itself. Could you talk a little bit about uh, you were primarily saying uh, this was to help scale and continue the company to grow, but could you talk a little bit about like the process of like selling your company and um, some of the thought that went into that? Yeah, happy to. Um, that was probably one of the most stressful aspects ever. So one of the things, so when you're selling your company, I mean, I learned this all on the fly. I just, I had never done this before. So, uh, you know, they want to look at all your books and all that stuff. So you want to make sure that your paperwork is super well organized. We were pretty good. We were, we definitely like were intentional about organizing our paperwork from the, from the start, but it wasn't good enough. And so it's one of those things like, as a new founder, I would highly recommend like keep your paperwork in order from day one, because otherwise it's just like, it's just such a pain. One of the things to keep in mind is when you're selling, you're still running the company. And so anyone who's a founder knows that they literally have no time to start with. And so now if you're selling and gathering paperwork at the same time, it's like you have no time squared. So that becomes like very stressful. And I mean, you can easily get high strung. I was definitely pretty high strung for a while during that process. And it, it's one of those things that like you, you can't slack on any, any basic component. And one of the other big stressors is that, you know, you get a letter of intention and LOI and those are basically an outline of the terms. Um, and so you start the due diligence process 
And the due diligence process is like basically when you start paying lawyers. So just because you're in due diligence doesn't mean this deal will go through. And so even, even from the selling side, uh, your lawyers are going to be expensive. So you're kind of, you know, you're, you're taking a shot, but if it doesn't work out, like you're out a lot of money and you're out a lot of time. So I always say crypto lawyers are the only winners in bull markets and bear markets. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So they're definitely, it's definitely a lot of work. Um, another one is that you're kind of managing two legal teams. And so the, the buying lawyers want all these things. Your lawyer wants all these things. And everyone's timeline is super compressed and rushed. And if someone's late a day to respond, like everyone's yelling at each other. So there's a lot of that. Um, so that's kind of another thing you want to keep in, in, in mind to manage. And it's a really big roller coaster ride because you're thinking, okay, what do I do if this doesn't go through? Like, how do we survive as a company? How does my team, like, I don't want my team to be demoralized. It's not a thing that we're getting acquired and versus not getting acquired, stuff like that. Um, and then you have a lot of people's interests that you're balancing. So you have like all your investors who got into your company at different points. So like my round one investors, like they're like, they're happy. <laughs> my round two investors, well, we're, we, it, we raise in the bull market and we're selling in the bear market. And so there's kind of that to balance with those expectations to balance with them. And then you have all your employees, like you want to make sure to do right by them. And then you also have to, make sure that the deal is fair for you and for the buyer. So like, don't, I mean, this is, I have a sample size of one, but my thinking was don't go in thinking like, Oh, I'm getting bought out. Like I won the lottery. Like you're not going to get everything you want when you're getting acquired. And the buyer is not going to get everything they want when they're buying you. It's like, you're looking to get a fair deal where it's fair for both sides. Otherwise, like if they overpay for you, it's going to be a nightmare when you're working for them. They're going to be, like feeling buyer's remorse. And if, if you undersell yourself, you're going to, you're going to be feeling seller's remorse. And so there's a lot of interests to balance and it's really like a, a tight needle to thread. Yeah. It's, it, it is interesting. Uh, and I'm sure you learned quite a bit going through that process. Uh, it, yeah. I mean, the whole founder's journey is quite unique. There's a lot of things that you just simply didn't know in the beginning. And as you kind of progress, like you just pick up all these random skills and um, it is hard, especially on like the legal side. There's a lot of hoops to jump through, but uh, mm. no, definitely appreciate you sharing on maybe shifting slightly. Um, you recently kind of put out the volatility report and uh, and some of the high, high level thoughts there. Could you? Uh, share them uh, here? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of high level, basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at our data lake and analyze four years of Bitcoin volatility data and see if we can sort of determine volatility regimes. So when you're looking at the volatility surface, there's a lot of different components to it. There's sort of the wings and the spine. So the spine is really the term structure, meaning at the money volatility for each different expiration. And then the wings are out-of-the-money options for calls versus out-of-money options for puts. So in equities and commodities, these relationships are pretty well defined. They've been around forever, uh, but that wasn't always the case. So I don't know if you've heard of the 1987 crash. I'm sure you have, but maybe for your listeners. In 1987, we had a huge stock market crash um, that dropped like 20% in one day on, on some random Monday. And so before that, the way that people priced implied volatility on the indexes was that they would have flat implied volatility, meaning at the money implied volatility was 13 and out of money options were also 13. And so when that 1987 crash happened, people realized that those models were wrong because if, if the market actually gets to those out of the money options, it by definition requires more volatility to get there. And so the volatility environment will be different by definition. And so that actually should, instead of being priced at 13, should be maybe priced higher at call it 22. And so now you have an a, a implied volatility skew. And so what we're trying to do in the Bitcoin space is we're trying to quantify, you know, have these relationships been determined? You know, does, it, does the Bitcoin volatility surface have some sort of like predetermined shape to it that essentially it trades around? And so my opinion and my conclusion is that no, it's not. It's not defined yet. 
And we've seen times where Bitcoin calls are more expensive than puts. Add the money calls are cheaper than add the money. Um, those relationships are completely inverse. And then we look at the term structure as well. You know, options that expired three days versus three months versus nine months. What are, what, are, what are those relationships look like? And so we spent a lot of time quantifying that. So those are really sort of interesting high level aspects. And then we ran a couple back tests to find some profitable strategies. On kind of having the space be more defined in terms of volatility, what do you think it will take for the market to get there? Just larger players in the space, uh, better uh, markets like Deribit to trade on? I'm, I'm curious, like what, what needs to happen? Yeah, that's a great point. So I definitely think more participants increases efficiency. You just have more people thinking about things. You have more capital sloshing around, things like that. So that's definitely part of it. I think another part is just time because essentially since Bitcoin and crypto is such a new asset class, you know, who's to say what it's really worth? And then who's to say the path it takes as it finds its true value? And so the path would be the volatility. The value would be sort of like the price. And so all these are big questions that have yet to be determined. And then lastly, it's like Bitcoin at $30 is going to behave a lot differently than Bitcoin at $30,000. The market caps are different. The players themselves are different. Um, the venues to trade on are different, things like that. So a lot of these things are part of a maturing market. And so it's really interesting to kind of see or try to determine you know, the path of, of, of the asset price. And so I, I really think that a lot of it is going to be just time, but new market participants and more market participants will help as well. And when you're kind of growing the company and pulling analytics, uh, kind of scaling, what were the biggest things that you found as like a barrier to getting more market participants? Is it overall just like growing the asset class in terms of size from like a trillion to like 5 trillion, 10 trillion? Is it making like better applications on chain? Um, what, what, what are the hesitancies for new participants to join? So in the crypto vol space, the big one, in my opinion, is, is that the U.S. market is essentially still kind of locked out. We have CME futures and future options, and we just got the Beto, which is that Bitcoin ETF that launched last year. So those are those are big moves forward. But at the end of the day, like the main market is Deribit, the US can't trade on Deribit, and so that shuts out a, a lot of participants. Um, the world's biggest options market is in the US, and so it makes sense that like once that bridge can be, once that gap can be bridged, we'll see, uh, we'll see more adoption. But just to kind of give you an idea of the, the size of, this, of the, the markets, so like if I look at Bitcoin market cap versus the notional option open interest, it's about 6% of the market cap. If I look at stocks, like for SPY, for example, the S&P 500 ETF, the notional open interest is 200% of the market cap. So there's a huge difference in the relationship between the options market and the underlying market. and then the market cap of Bitcoin itself is very small. So I could see the Bitcoin market cap 10x, and then I could see the notional options open interest 30x. And so that's a huge like differential today for where, from where it could be in the future. Uh, that's great context. I mean, crazy how small relative to traditional markets that crypto actually is. I, I think, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the space and it continuing to grow uh, I mean, there's many metrics like that. I think even looking at like the more popular applications like Uniswap or OpenSea, uh, there's less than like 5 million people that have like interacted with those applications like like individually. And so, I don't know, there, there's a lot of things to look forward to just on the growth standpoint. Um, in terms of the company, I mean, you obviously now have been acquired. How has like if any things change like the day-to-day -day operations and how, I guess, like from the product standpoint, what are you guys now like marching forward as like the North star? Yeah. So I think from a day-to-day -day operations, the integration has been really smooth. So I'm, I'm super pleased with that. Um, we've been able to just kind of just do business as usual 
and slowly integrate to like match our colors and things like that, sort of the easy stuff. But sort of the direction has been uh, still like uh, very independent, not not totally independent, but I have a lot of kind of input on the direction. So I've been really pleased with the integration. The next thing that we're sort of marching towards, I mean, we're always adding new data sources and making new features. That's a forever game. But I think the next sort of big element is going to be uh, some sort of portfolio management tools. So especially because of a company like Amber Data, which has like holistic crypto data, it, it becomes really interesting to say, okay, you know, I log in with my wallet. I can see all my Lyra option positions. I can see my Deribit option positions. I can see my Uniswap LP positions. I can see my whatever other assets on some other DEX positions all in one place. Now I can have like a holistic portfolio tool that helps me like check out all the metrics. So I can see change shifts in spot price, shifts in time, shifts in implied ball, shifts in all the Greeks and stuff like that. And and so that's really what we're marching towards. And and really you can only do that holistically from a company like Amber Data. So I'm really excited about that. And I guess Ember data makes it a lot easier to integrate with those data sources. Exactly. And from a investor perspective, like, again, we haven't figured out what crypto should be worth. We haven't determined what the path should be worth. Another unexplored area is how does, how do these data sets interact with each other? Like how do on-chain flows translate to implied volatility or how does like NFT trading translate to like, ERC twenty trades and stuff like that. So no one, no one yet that I know of. I'm sure people are going to get started soon. But like looking at all the data, how it all interacts with each other, is like a undiscovered gold mine. And there's definitely going to be some nuggets there of profitability. Definitely, definitely. I mean, so I think the NFT kind of asset class for me personally kind of caught me a little bit off guard and how popular they actually became, but. Now, very excited just for the kind of user onboarding uh, point of view of NFTs. Is there ever like any synergies that you think down the line between like NFTs and options market? Or are you going to strictly kind of stick to like the more traditional markets uh, and trading? So my co-founder loves NFTs. Like he's all over that. And <laughs> he's definitely done pretty good trading NFTs. So I definitely think there's a lot to explore there. To me, like the relationships that are very interesting would be like, what is the correlation between NFTs and Bitcoin prices? What is the beta of NFTs to Bitcoin prices? And then, you know, can I trade Bitcoin options versus an NFT? So like basically I, I buy a couple punks and then I sell Bitcoin options to finance those. And then if the market rallies, I'll lose all my options, but my punks should outperform. If the market goes down, you know, whatever it is. And so I think those are really interesting relationships. That would be, yeah, very interesting. Um, fascinating. And then, so are you like um, with Genesis Volatility primarily focused on pulling like data sources from Ethereum or are you kind of chain agnostic? Yeah, for us, it's mostly been CFI. We're chain agnostic, so we're more protocol specific for the DeFi ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Optimism and Arbitrum for uh, Lyra and then Mainnet for Sweep or Open Sweep. Um, and then Premia is on a bunch of different chains as well. So we cover that. And then Ribbon, we cover that as well. So we're, we're definitely like EVM <laughs> uh, focused for sure. But uh, yeah, I would say definitely EVM for sure. Uh, Any interest in looking outside of the EVM world or is that going to kind of be the sandbox that the team plays in? I think Amber Data has that interest. Uh, me mm -hmm. personally, not really. I think I'll stay at EVM forever. Um, but I'm I'm not I'm not really the on chain guy. That's really my co founder. But he, speaking for him, he's EVM forever as well. So it comes out to be the same. Nice, nice, um, very interesting. Um, and then maybe kind of shifting the conversation a little bit again. I mean, obviously, I mean in 2021, um, there was a lot happening just with the feds and printing and then 2022 kind of uh, things have definitely changed. And then now going into 2023 uh, kind of like people overall, like we're resetting and trying to figure out 
where we're at. I'd be curious on your point of view and like how you've seen things evolve and where we're at now today on like the macro perspective. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've kind of been sticking to my guns on this and it's not the popular opinion, but I think like, I think we're at a really interesting inflection point. So we, we're going from like globalization to deglobalization with like sort of political risk that I know nothing about. We're also going from like a low or easy money uh, monetary policy to not easy money monetary policy, which is interesting. We're at the sort of the tail end of a 30 year bond market rally, uh, which, you know, how does that impact everything? And then the Western world is incredibly indebted. Like, can we, you know, how, how do we handle uh, a sustainable inflation if that does occur? And so that's kind of another big question mark. To me, the way that crypto is behaving seems very like, uh, in, like counterintuitive to like what other risk assets are doing. So like we're seeing higher bond yields. We're seeing gold drop a lot, a lot in value. And so like, if you make the argument that, you know, Bitcoin is digital gold, well, Bitcoin's sort of doing its own thing, but maybe Bitcoin is actually more like the NASDAQ. So maybe that's the case. Well, you know, tech stocks, those are a little bit of a question mark right now, depending on what rates do. Um, and then commodities have come off a lot, uh, but maybe they'll come back up if there's geopolitical tensions mounting again. Like, it, it just seems like very unsure. And I, I just don't have a lot of confidence personally uh, on my analysis, on like analysis, on my analysis right now. I just think like there's a lot of big question marks. And if anything, I'm more on the cautious side. And I think higher rates probably, like bond market is the, bond market is the market. I, I think that's probably the most efficient market and, and the one that's, has the most participants in it who think through these things. So, so in terms of like relating it back to crypto, how do you kind of see with all that being said, playing out in 2023, do you think it's kind of mirrors the 2018, 2019, 2020 cycle where we just have kind of sideways for a while in terms of uh, markets more broadly? Um, do you think, just with how infrastructure has progressed on like the crypto side that we still get user adoption. I'm curious. Yeah. I, I think for crypto prices, if we're going to like a restrictive monetary policy, like environment, crypto's never been in that environment. And so, so to me, the way that I'm thinking about it is if prices go down, like I'm interested in Bitcoin 10,000, like I'll, that's like a buy level that interests me. If we don't get to that level, then I'm buying on the higher side. Like I'll buy when there's kind of more certainty and there's never perfect certainty, but when like a lot of these questions have been answered, like, you know, inflation has clearly shown that it's, it's like was transitory and now it's gone and Bitcoin is $40,000 and I'll look to try to get long on, on, on the upside uh, at that point. So just this middle range, I'm sort of like, I'm just still kind of, it could go either way. Yeah. Are, are, I mean, I know your day to day is really in the nuts and bolts of like trading and options and the volatility markets, but are there any other specifically like products that you follow closely that are on chain outside of those uh, like immediate purview? Yeah. Lyra is the only one is right now. It's the only crypto that I own. And to me, it's, it's like a, it's a product that makes a lot of sense to me. It solves like the market making pain point for an on-chain options protocol and at the same time it has just as good of like a user experience from the taker side so to me that that solves kind of the two pain points so i think that's a really interesting one um and that's that's really where my focus has been on the on-chain side interesting very cool and then maybe jumping back a little bit uh you said like you, you have very strong conviction around like ethereum and like ethereum's kind of roadmap. Could you share a little bit more about like what ultimately led you to build such strong conviction? Yeah. So one of the things is like Ethereum is a base layer. So like every like a lot of projects are built on top of Ethereum. A lot of the other tokens are built on top of Ethereum infrastructure. Like all the not all the stable coins, but essentially all the ones that matter uh, are like within the Ethereum ecosystem. 
All the interesting layer twos are built on the EVM. And so to me, it's one of those things where like the dev developer environment is really seems to be centered around Ethereum and is resilient on Ethereum. And so to me, that's kind of like the winning ticket. Like ultimately, like wherever people build is where I think the real value will accrue. So like a lot of the NFTs that was built on Ethereum, the ICO craze was built on Ethereum, uh, the DeFi <laughs> innovation was built on Ethereum. Like everything is essentially built on Ethereum. To me, it's like it's it's crazy that Ethereum is not the number one market cap. But I I felt like that since 2016. So we'll see. But I am I am surprised the smart contract platform is not kind of supplanted Bitcoin as number one so far. It, it does seem obvious in the long term that uh, a smart contract platform will be more valuable than Bitcoin alone. That's how I feel too. Yeah, for sure. And then I guess, so I always ask this question recently and it's been a little bit more spicy. What would make you kind of like change your mind on like the Ethereum ecosystem or kind of pause your conviction in that maybe what you initially thought is not totally playing out? Yeah, I mean, I would I would say this, this is actually true today and this is where I, I and give points to, to Fabio on the Amber Data team as well, I, the other options guy. Um, I think like the direction of sort of like the values of, of the Ethereum community, for example, like I'm not a big Davos crowd guy. And so like if we're going that direction, like I, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want more government. I want less government. And so to me, like the Bitcoin values are a lot more congruent to that. And I think that's what's kind of interesting from Bitcoin perspective um and so i don't know if like that's kind of the, the one thing that like trips me out i mean obviously like the ethereum ecosystem is separate from that you know whatever vitalik's convictions are or are not not that i pay super close attention to his but ultimately he, he is not ethereum alone but that would be kind of something that gives me pause like i don't want <laughs> i don't know i, I don't want like, so the or to, like government control so, so is it more just so I understand correctly? Like, is it more like an elitist community, or is it more just like being able to like with the OFAC like censor specific transactions? Yes, censor specific. I mean, elitism is not something that I think is cool, but like, it's that's not that's not what worries me. Like, I'm worried about like censorship or like basically like surveillance or things like that. Things where yeah. it's like you don't tow the party government line, then we'll do something to you. And then on the layer two side, like uh, what's kind of caught your eye and what do you find most interesting there? Yeah, well, optimism and arbitrum are, are pretty interesting. Um, another one that was really cool, and this is not from an investment perspective, but it's just from a, a kind of use case perspective, like immutable X. Uh, is a really interesting sort of I was a big gods and chain guy and I really liked that game and I was like playing it for a long time and so it's just kind of interesting that sort of that side of the ecosystem as well um, and so to me like digital game assets and stuff like that whether it's a card game or another type of game uh, I don't know I think there's probably something there I don't know that it's been a solved puzzle yet but I do think that's going to be somewhere in the future yeah on, I guess, like the adoption side or gaming side, like what do you feel like will be the catalyst to like outside of just like number go up with price, which always helps. But like from actual user adoption, I, I think, I mean, looking back to 2017, it was like ICOs, um, which I guess could be debatable from a product point of view, but served its purpose. And then ultimately, uh, then you got DeFi summer in like 2020 and then NFTs. Do you have like in point of view or in your point of view, do you have like a particular thing that will be a catalyst or do you think it's uh, kind of open-ended? Yeah, I'm not sure. I would say it's more open-ended. It's just one of those things that I'm not an expert in. I thought the gods and chained was cool because it was like Hearthstone was a precedent as far as like the adoption of a game. That's very fun. So is magic the gathering. And then from a digital asset perspective, like magic the gathering cards, our huge collectibles market. So to me, like gods and chain could be similar to that. So again, there's like, there's clear precedence 
that I could use as a model for for that type of game. That makes sense. Uh, maybe just as we wrap up, like a couple of closing thoughts, like uh, on the option side, I mean, because you're so in the weeds, uh, on like the day to day of that, are there any like specific markets that you think, I mean, going back to earlier, you said there are a lot of them are kind of not effectively priced. Uh, but are there any like particularly that you think are like kind of wacky that people should explore? Yeah, totally. So it's really one of these things in bull markets. There's like an opportunity overload overload, and it's like everything seems like it's working. But one of the things that works really well in bull markets is the cash and carry trade, meaning the futures are trading at a huge premium over cash markets. And so you can, you can buy Bitcoin, send it to the exchange, sell the future, and essentially get a free spread. So that's a really interesting trade. I've seen it as high as 50% annualized returns with no delta risk. So that's pretty cool. Excuse me. So that's pretty cool. Another one is going to be the option skew. So again, in the same vein, when like the market is in strong bull mark, bullish mode, people are just kind of YOLO buying calls and they start really overpaying for those calls. And what you can do is you can buy Bitcoin, sell a call and use that premium to buy a put. And because the calls are so much more expensive than the puts, you basically collar your position. And so if the market rallies, you make like three times what you're risking. And so that allows you to like take up a lot of leverage in like a measured in like a responsible way. Um, so that's really interesting. And then in the right now world, I think one that's interesting is that grayscale discount. Right? It's like a 50% discount, which is essentially a hundred percent discount. Because if you're buying the asset today and it rallies and close to that gap, it's gonna needs to rally a hundred percent. That's an interesting way to get long crypto. Um I don't know if that's going to close ever. I don't know the details, just stuff behind the, the curtain, but that seems interesting to me. I, I guess like, I mean, there's a lot of knowledge that you ultimately accumulated to get to this point with options. Are there any good resources that you would point people that are still new to the space on the option market that want to kind of learn more about volatility, learn about options and like how to get involved? Yeah, so one of my favorite books ever is Volatility Trading by Ewan Sinclair. That's one of my favorites. That's more advanced. There's a kind of a predecessor to that called Options Trading. Uh, that's another good book of his. Um, and then some of my favorite books uh, in trading in general is Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas, which is sort of the psychology of trading. And then um, Option Pricing and Volatility by Nattenberg is also a really good book. Perfect. Oh, and then One Good Trade. Uh, but Mike Bellafuyere of SB Capital is a very good book. Awesome. No, I, I I think I mean in general options are definitely more complex, and so uh, being able to wrap your head around them and like fully understand them definitely takes some time. And so appreciate uh, having an expert kind of share what he views as uh, good resources. And then maybe lastly to kind of wrap up the podcast, what are your I mean now I mean. We kind of talked about it a little bit, like how it was a little difficult to raise, re, raise your first round, but the second round was a little bit more uh, easy. And then ultimately deciding to sell the company and kind of grow uh, internally within this company. What were uh, like just lessons or advice that you would give to founders kind of as you've gone through this entire process of starting a company, raising, selling, uh, any words of wisdom as, as we kind of wrap it up? Yeah, totally. I think there's, it's hard to see what I did right, but the things that I would change that I did wrong. So one of them would be having your paperwork in order from day one and like just be immaculate with it, immaculate. And two is like your biggest bottleneck is going to be people. And so having like a process to hire talent or source talent and keep talent, uh, because once, once you do hit those scaling thresholds, you're going to be really happy to have that process down. And I, essentially like people are, I mean, people was basically the only thing that matters. So um, I think that process is, is really important. Pro keep your process in place and uh, keep your books uh, clean and orderly. Uh, good advice. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, appreciate you sharing your journey, your founder's journey, uh, how you kind of started the company, how you um, ultimately were able to sell the company and s continue to grow it. Um, and then all the interesting things on options and volatility. Really appreciate your time and uh, appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Logan.